This car holds a 20 year old land speed record at the Bonneville Salt Flats. Its tyres are Kevlar lined and run on nitrogen at 100 psi when on a speed run. It will do 100 miles per hour in first gear and has to be push started to get it rolling. It has to run on super high 100 octane fuel just to start it up. It has straps on the windows to stop them from blowing out at speed and a roll cage that can only be described as a work of art. It has three phase fire extinguisher system, no brakes and two parachutes just to slow it down. This car is one of a kind. What is it? It's an MG Rover 75 Estate. This is in fact the X-Works MG Bonneville ZT T765. Codename X15 and built in 2002 for MG by the SoCar Speed Shop, California, USA. The mission, with no financial limit, had one goal in mind. The first non-production estate car to break the 200 mile per hour barrier at the 5 mile Bonneville long course. In August 2003, it didn't just break it. With Bonneville veteran Pat Kine at the wheel, it smashed it with a whopping 306.9 km per hour final run. That's 225.6 miles per hour in old money. The last couple of weeks I've been privileged to spend my time alongside the owner of this fantastic machine as the guys at the garage prepared the car for the MG Centenary event at the British Motor Museum in Gaden, England. John, the owner, gave me full permission to take this exclusive footage and share it all with you. MG and motorsport enthusiasts have long speculated where this car might be. The car has in fact been in dry storage here in the UK for over 12 years and hasn't run properly since his last Bonneville appearance in 2008. Despite articles that you might read about this car, it's very heavily modified. It boasts an 800 brake horsepower, 6 litre, normally aspirated V8 Roush performance engine at red lines at 9,500 RPM. It has a Nax car bottom end with a Panos LMP1 top end and fitted to a NASCAR 5 speed race transmission. The only thing remotely MG Rover about this car is the top half of the body shell, the lights, and a few bits of interior trim. The floor pan was cut out to convert the car to rear wheel drive, with strengthening bars and extra weight added. Unlike a normal race car, they need to add weight to make it more stable on the salt. As the owner told me, you don't drive in a straight line on the salt. You're in a constant two-way power slide, or tank slap. With every fibre of your body and all your racing instincts turned on their head, as you start to slide, you have to keep your toe down, or it will spit you out like a piece of old chewing gum. You don't drive this thing. You point it in a vague direction, plant your foot, and hold on for dear life. So can we get it started? And will it run at all? As you can imagine, it's not just a case of turning the key and popping to the shops. It may be an estate car, but this is no shopping trolley or family runaround. The bottom end is a dry sump. The oil is stored in a cylinder in the boot and the whole system has to be primed with a pump and heater element. Oh yeah, and 120 octane fuel. That's over 50 pound a gallon, and a full chat, this thing will eat that in less than a mile. 
as if the pressure of a one-of-a-kind vehicle isn't enough, this engine cost just under $300,000 to build in 2003. No pressure then. The boys have already filled the cylinder with oil. That's 15W50 fully synthetic. The pump pressurises the system while the element heats the oil to temperature. That is then pumped into the engine. Cross your fingers. consider myself a petrol head. Yeah, I love cars, but I do so for the freedom that they give me. The ability to go anywhere, anytime, and do whatever I want to do. But this car isn't that. To me it was more about the story behind it. The more I listened to John talk about the car, where it came from, his passion was infectious, and the car, the story, just sucked me in. It may have arrived on a trailer, a zooped up shopping trolley with a big engine. But what an engine. When that was running with me filming the exhaust six feet away, the noise far too strong for the microphone on the iPhone to make sense of it, it was ticking over at 2000 RPM. The occasional blip from John's right toe could tip it to 4000. Even at the midway point on the rev counter, my ears were ringing and all my mind was telling me was to get away. But my body wouldn't move. It was like the Pied Piper with me under its spell. After a minute, I had to move as John shut the engine down. I went outside and one of the others spoke to me. Well, the lips moved, but no words were heard. It took around five minutes for my ears to stop ringing for me to be able to hear properly again. It has certainly left its mark on me. It will stay with me for a long time. A huge thank you to John for allowing me the opportunity to film and bring this story to you. To me, it was a once in a lifetime experience that I didn't want to pass up. <laughs> 